Berlin early this morning. Amid the scattered debris of the festive season, a weapon of mass murder is slowly removed. For the second time this year, a lorry has been used to target traditional celebrations in Europe. Chaotic scenes last night after the truck ploughed at speed through the market. Wooden stalls splintered and dozens of people caught up in the mayhem. I hear a loud noise from the houses that were um, destroyed by the truck and um, heard some screams and yeah, that was uh, the first impression. I can actually show you, um, it's from my balcony as well. Um, it's just like uh, from my house is um, two minutes drive. What was in my mind? I, you could, you can't, you can't think of anything. You're just shocked, and you just want to help those people. I went down. People were, um, you know, asking for help, but we just, um, I just took two wooden parts on on top of them, but I couldn't do much. I couldn't help them all. I saw people lying on the on the ground, in, you know, all. Bodies been twisted, you know, like arms, legs were, you know, people were on top of each other. The truck had Polish number plates. A body found in the cab is thought to be that of its Polish driver, but a masked man behind the wheel escaped on foot. Soon afterwards, a suspect was picked up just over a mile away. He's said to be a Pakistani citizen who arrived in Germany a year ago. If this was the work of an asylum seeker, it poses a real challenge for the woman who threw open the country's doors over a year ago. I know it will be particularly difficult for us all to bear if it is confirmed that the perpetrator had asked for protection and asylum in Germany. That would be particularly repulsive for the many, many Germans who are engaged day in, day out in helping refugees and for those who genuinely do need our protection and who are striving to integrate themselves into our country. Germany's interior minister said security would be stepped up across the country, but the Germans should not succumb to fear. Bastille Day, a national holiday in France. This year, July the 14th, turned into a day of mourning. 86 people lost their lives as a truck ploughed headlong through the crowd. Five months later, and the parallels have been drawn with the horrors in Berlin. It was the latest in a string of attacks in Germany. But until Monday evening, German police had been spared dealing with multiple deaths. In recent months, security personnel had to deal with incidents committed by individuals. On July the 18th, a 17-year-old Afghan, who was later shot dead by police officers, seriously wounded four people with a knife on a train near Würzburg. Twelve people were wounded in a suicide bomb attack in the foyer of a concert hall in Ansbach on July the 24th. It happened when a 27-year-old Syrian detonated a bomb in his backpack. The bomber's asylum claim had been rejected, but he had been allowed to stay temporarily in Germany and lived in the city in an apartment. He received psychiatric treatment after allegedly attempting to take his own life twice. In another incident, police foiled an apparent attack planned by a 22-year-old Syrian. Investigators believe an airport was the target. The suspect was arrested on October the 10th after two days of searches by security personnel who had seized explosives. The police found bomb-making material which was similar to that used in the attacks in Paris and Brussels in the suspect's apartment in the eastern German city of Chemnitz. The police action came after a tip-off from Germany's domestic intelligence service. Two days after his arrest in Leipzig, the alleged terrorist committed suicide while being detained in prison. Last week, the German police revealed details of two planned attacks by a 12-year-old boy of German-Iraqi background. He had tried to set off explosives in his hometown of Ludwigshaven. He had reportedly been radicalised by an agent of the so-called Islamic State. His targets, the town hall and a local Christmas market. On Tuesday, the European Union agreed on imposing stricter gun laws, however balked at the proposal for a complete ban on some of the most lethal semi-automatic weapons, such as the Kolechnikov. Proposed in 2015 but disputed by the bloc's 28 member nations, the measure comes in response to the overwhelming rise in militant attacks which claimed the lives of 130 people in Paris in November of last year. The new rules restrict access to some high-caliber weapons and make it easier to track guns to reduce black market sales. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker said in a statement, 
We have fought hard for an ambitious deal that reduces the risk of shootings in schools, summer camps, or terrorist attacks with legally held firearms. In Ankara, a Turkish policeman crying Aleppo and al Ragbar shot dead Russia's ambassador to Turkey. Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country will intensify its fight against terrorism. Ambassador Andrei Karlov died of his wounds after the shooting at an Ankara exhibition center. It comes on the eve of a key meeting in Moscow between the Russian, Turkish and Iranian foreign ministers on the Syrian conflict. CCTV's Mikhail Badavid reports from the Turkish-Syrian border. This assassination took place in the capital Ankara in the Chankai district where this contemporary art gallery is located. The Russian ambassador Andrei Karlov was delivering a speech when he was assassinated. There was a man standing behind him during uh, the time when the Russian ambassador was giving this speech. Uh, he was there the whole time. The attacker was listening to the speech. He first shot into the air and later shot the Russian ambassador from behind. The attacker, he made statements uh, both in Arabic and in Turkish. He made statements like um, Allah Akbar, which is in Arabic for God is great. He said, do not forget Aleppo, do not forget Syria. Everyone who has taken part in the suppression will pay. These are the words of the attacker, uh, the terrorist, we can call him now, who assassinated the Russian ambassador to Turkey. This murder is uh, clearly a provocation aimed at undermining the improvement and the normalization of the Russian-Turkish relations, as well as uh, at uh, undermining the peace process in Syria promoted by Russia, Turkey, Iran and other countries uh, interested in uh, settling this conflict in Syria. The only response we should, uh, we should offer to this murder is uh, stepping up our fight against terror, and uh, the criminals will feel the heat. As the world watches the unfolding evacuation of Aleppo, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has expressed moral outrage, accusing Syrian government forces of carrying out nothing short of a massacre in the city. Speaking from Washington, Kerry also accused President Assad's allies, Russia and Iran, of aiding the slaughter. And the Assad regime is actually carrying out nothing short of a massacre. And we have witnessed indiscriminate slaughter, not accidents of war, not collateral damage, but frankly purposeful, a cynical policy of terrorizing civilians. While Kerry also urged the Syrian leadership to return to peace talks in Geneva, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said Turkey, which had helped broker the evacuation of Aleppo, was ready to receive its most vulnerable civilians. Speaking in Ankara, Erdogan said, if necessary, we will take some part of those who have left and bring them to Turkey. Children, the elderly, those who are really in difficult conditions, and place them in camps and houses if they are available. We will provide them with a peaceful environment. The UN's peace envoy to Syria, Stefan de Mistura, says around 50,000 people still remain in eastern Aleppo. Around a third of those are said to include rebel fighters and their families. Behind me, you can see the buses. As you can see, they are right behind me. The people are getting ready to move, and this is the situation here. Last night, there were sub-zero temperatures, and the, the, it, the cold was quite bitter. Uh, so the people have been huddled around fires and they're just trying to get a bit of warmth uh, so that they can uh, continue on with their journey. Now some of them have been out here for several days and they have been staying in burned out buildings, buildings that have no walls, doing anything that they possibly can to stay warm.
South Sudan is on the brink of genocide, and the U.S. might be able to stop it. One estimate says some 50,000 people have died in just the past two years, but the world has largely stopped watching. Civilians are suffering the most. Nearly three million people have been displaced. The U.S. is intertwined in the conflict there and is South Sudan's largest source of funds. The U.S. helped South Sudan gain independence, but as political turmoil has increased in the country, the U.S. has threatened to stop offering aid. They are blowing whistles to remind President Joseph Kabila of the end of his term. These young Congolese want him to step down. And so they are occupying the streets and mounting barricades to show their anger. We will be out in the streets until he leaves, he tells me. We are not afraid of him and his forces. He's got to go. There was no election as planned this year, and it's part of a political crisis but the malaise is deeper. We're not here in support of the opposition either, he says. We're here for our own rights. A third day of protests against plans by Poland's ruling Law and Justice Party to restrict journalists' access to parliamentary sessions. Supporters of the PIS party are also demonstrating in Warsaw, while opposition MPs are staging a sit-in in the plenary chamber of parliament until at least Tuesday. President André Duda, who's aligned with the governing party, has offered to mediate between the two sides. The Senate Speaker conceded changes were needed. The Law and Justice Party and the Speaker of the Lower Chamber of Parliament, Marek Kuczynski, each want to improve journalists' working conditions, he said. We all know that these are not the best. They're not good. They require some adjustment, some changes. Opposition politicians and protesters claim the PIS is attempting to stifle press freedom. The government, however, says it does not think the proposed measures are restrictive. Police have opened fire on protesters in parts of Venezuela after looting broke out due to a severe cash crisis. It follows a move by the Latin American country's socialist government to pull the nation's most widely used banknote from circulation. Amid the highest inflation rate in the world, the 100 Bolivar bill was worth just two US cents before it ceased to be legal tender last week. Despite promises from President Nicolas Maduro that new, higher denominated cash bills were ready, they're nowhere to be seen, leaving most Venezuelans without any viable currency. I've been here since four o'clock yesterday afternoon, this woman said. I've not had any lunch or breakfast because of these damn bills that nobody wants anywhere. The latest wave of economic chaos in Venezuela has sparked panic, resulting in large queues outside banks as people scramble to deposit and replace the worthless bills. Many cash points are reported to be broken or empty or even still distributing the defunct currency, forcing many people to rely on credit cards and bank transfers to get by. The U.S. Department of Justice has asked European bank Credit Suisse to pay between $5 billion and $7 billion to settle the probe over the bank's sale of toxic mortgage securities leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. The bank has reportedly been pushing for a smaller penalty. An inside source said Credit Suisse is confident of reaching a better solution. The penalty is a result of President Obama's 2012 initiative to hold banks accountable for selling mortgage debt without informing investors of the risk. With the national debt pile at 133% of GDP, the last thing Italy might want is yet more debt. But that's exactly what it might need to save its ailing banks, according to its new prime minister. We have begun an operation that I would define as a saving of savings. The cabinet meeting approved a document to go before parliament which authorizes the government to use funds. 20 billion euros is the sum in question, sources telling Reuters that at least 15 billion of that's earmarked for Monte dei Paschi and several other smaller banks. 
in a sector burdened with around 350 billion euros of non-performing loans. In a surprise move by Thailand's military government, its poorest citizens are receiving cash handouts. Despite criticizing the country's reliance on state subsidies, the government says it needs to stimulate its economy. CCTV's Martin Lowe reports. Nin has traveled to her local bank to collect her cash payment. She's one of around 7 million Thais receiving the state handout. Nin collects waste for recycling, but it pays very little. There's never enough money to take care of her and her son. Many Thais are in debt, as the once booming export-based economy has been hit by a global slump. Political unrest has led to low consumer confidence. Now, the military government is to hand out around 350 million U.S. dollars as an end-of-year gift to those officially categorized as impoverished. Now, the Iran Sanctions Act becomes law without the U.S. president's endorsement after a deadline for Barack Obama to sign the measures expired on Thursday. The White House had earlier stated that Obama would sign the Sanctions Renewal Act into law in 10 days after the Congress unanimously passed the bill. Now, White House spokesman Josh Ernest says the administration has used its authorities to waive the sanctions as part of Washington's commitments under the Iran nuclear deal. The U.S. keeps saying the new law that extends sanctions against Iran for another decade does not violate the nuclear deal. But Iran maintains that the renewal of the measures does breach the accord reached with the P5 plus 1 and would face a strong response from Tehran. Russia's deputy foreign minister says that his country describes, quote, as hostile new U.S. sanctions on Moscow over the conflict in Ukraine and is prepared to respond accordingly. Sergei Ryabkov says that the Kremlin reserves every right to pick the time, place, and form to react to Washington's anti-Russia measure in a way that suits Moscow. Ryabkov also says that Russia will expand its own sanctions list in response to the U.S. move. Earlier on Tuesday, the U.S. Treasury Department said that it added seven Russian individuals, eight entities, and two vessels to the list of U.S. sanctions. The individuals are blacklisted for allegedly having links to the previously sanctioned Russia Bank, as well as their business dealings with the Russian Federation Ministry of Defense. It may be the end of a long goodbye, but he's clearly not done yet. The new sanctions on Russia, a response the White House says to a spike in violence in Ukraine. But with less than a month to go before Obama leaves office, his team has been forced to defend the timing, insisting it has nothing to do with the transition to Trump. This decision by the Treasury Department had nothing to do with the time on the clock. It had everything to do with Russia's activities uh, and support for the separatists in Ukraine and for their occupation of uh, Crimea. That's what it had to do with. It had to do with Russia's actions. Those activities include the construction of a bridge to the Russian mainland, Two companies involved have been blacklisted, as well as others operating in Crimea. The sanctions also target executives at Bank Russia, known as the personal bank of state officials. All this could soon change, though. The president-elect has previously praised Vladimir Putin and said it would be good if the two countries could get along. The next administration will obviously have to make their own decisions about this. Uh, we hope that they will come to see um, uh, the wisdom in not conducting business as usual with Russia. The sanctions on Russia have stifled economic growth, but there are some who've benefited. Local farming's flourished as a result of the counter sanctions Russia imposed on food imports from the EU. Cheese, in particular, selling well. Huge explosions have blown apart a fireworks market in Mexico, killing at least 29 people and injuring dozens more. Some of the victims were caught in the rush to escape as a huge plume of smoke billowed into the sky. In Mexico, Christmas is the traditional time to light up the sky with fireworks. So more than a thousand people were shopping there in Tultepec, which is the country's best known fireworks market. The first small explosion kicked off a chain reaction that resulted in this. Shoppers scattered in every direction, but for many that escape only led to disaster. Rockets shot over the top of the giant market, landing several hundred kilometres away, starting new fires and even more explosions. Eventually nearly the whole market with 300 separate stalls, the biggest in Mexico, was a blast zone. 
sights and sounds that usually point to happiness and celebration signalled a dreadful pre-Christmas tragedy. Kids make the biggest messes. <laughs> The man who makes the mess disappear at Arvada High says he's got the best job in the world. It's not the job itself, but who he gets to work with. Well, I've been here 14 years and I love these kids and they love me. So I ask them how they're doing and cheer them up or if they got their head down, I make them pick their head up. They call him Wild Bill, the janitor unlike most. He goes to all the games, I mean all of them. I've never seen him miss one game. Even like in public he would wave to me and say hi and like ask me how my day was going and I was like wow. Everyone wants to support Bill because they know how much he would do for you. Two weeks ago, Bill's car, his only way to work, was stolen in the middle of the night. I dropped to my knees and cried. It's my pride and joy. The students know how much Bill loved his car. Ian Fonseca started a fundraiser for it on Wednesday. Like he's done so much for us, so we decided to give back to him. Call it a testament to his character. <laughs> Students raised more than $4,000 for the janitor in just two days. It means a lot to me. It means a lot of love and care. There's something special that you see in Bill that you'll do whatever it takes to help him as much as he helps you. A special bond he wouldn't trade for any other job in the world. These are my children here. This is my home. And this is where I retire someday.